begin today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is specialized strength training, kind of training what you intend to. So as, as coaches, we're always wanting to make an impact on our athletes. That's why we're bringing them into the weight room in the first place, hoping to make their performance on the field better. Um, but is what we're doing actually making that impact, actually having transfer? And I'm going to talk mainly, by, uh, mainly from an athlete uh, performance perspective, but this can be applied to normal population, to uh, normal everyday, just recreational athletes, recreational runners, anything that uh, when you're trying to make a specific change in somebody, uh, these kind of ideas can be applied. So kind of what I'm going over today, I'll have a, go through an explanation and a brief history of what specialized training actually is. Uh, the principle of dynamic correspondence is kind of the central tenet of it, how uh, you classify an exercise and how it correlates to the actual competition, to that competitive uh, sport or the specific movement that you're trying to work on. And also where specialized strength training fits into your plan because you can't just uh, throw it in there wherever you want to and expect to see the results. You have to have that foundation. Uh, talk about, uh, we've talked about already, going from general specific. It's that same general uh, layout, just a little more laid out here. And considerations for using SST, it gets pretty complicated, so I'm just going to go over a few things. And then finally, transfer of training, because that's, that's what it's all about. Are we actually making a change in our athletes that they can display out on the field? So first, what is specialized strength training? It sounds a little complicated, specialized, it's kind of weird. Uh, Sports-specific training is what you hear thrown around most often. The reason I don't really like sports-specific training is specialized training gets more uh, into specific movements that you might see in a bunch of different sports. Uh, many athletes run, many athletes change, uh, change direction. So all these things are needed. So what might be sports-specific to soccer uh, might also be in football where you need that specialized movement depending on what that athlete needs. And that might become more clear as I go. Uh, but to start off with a brief history, uh, just to get an idea of where this came from. Specialized exercise in general was first uh, mentioned by Leo Matviev, and if you guys have any history of strength and conditioning, he's also the father of periodization, classical uh, periodization or linear. He's the one that came up with that and also coined the term specialized exercise. Uh, he defined that these exercises are those that can make, uh, contain elements of the competitive actions either the variants or the parts, and uh, similar actions to those. So uh, if it's running, it's kind of mimicking running. We're using parts of that running motion, uh, whether it's the ankle extension or the paw back or the leg drive. Uh, those exercises are uh, specific to that motion. Basically, they're aimed at mastering the forms of movement and developing exercises to improve physical qualities. So the key thing here, uh, the pioneers of specialized exercises we're looking for was narrowing down to the key qualities of a movement, of a, of a series of movements, and working on those key qualities. Dr. Bergeshansky suggested that these special exercises, uh, their purpose was to increase the working effect of those key movements because that's what's going to make you better in that situation. So if you're working on running, getting better at pulling that foot down and uh, going to where you want to go at a faster rate, getting better at extending that ankle and moving faster. That's, that's what it's kind of all about. So specialized strength training, um, really right now with specialized exercise, what I've mentioned so far, it's been done on the field, uh, around the track, on the court. They were doing it, this was probably around the 60s and 70s when it was first really getting popular. And uh, they're doing it more out in the, in the field at their sport practice. Wasn't later, it wasn't until later that it was seen in the, in the weight room where uh, they actually got more specific there. But they used the part bowl method. So what I was talking about with different parts of the running motion, that'd be working on different parts. And all you can also throw in the hole. Uh, so I'll talk about it later, but resisted running would be working on that hole, hole method, whether you're pulling a sled or running with a parachute. Um, doing weighted jumps as opposed to unweighted jumps would be a resisted uh, full version of that competitive exercise, but it still could be a specialized exercise. Um, like I said, they were later added into the weight room as these guys realized, oh, hey, we could probably do some things under weight uh, 
in the weight room rather than just squat all the time, we can make this closer to what we're trying to achieve out on the field, out on the court, and actually see a better transfer. So that's that's when uh, specialized strength training was actually born and we started utilizing that. So specialized strength training in specific, uh, specifically is the pur has a purpose to intensify the work of the uh, muscular system in a specific regime or uh, such as concentric, isometric, things like that that you see in that sports activity or movement. And uh, provides an increase in the motor potential of the working muscle, so getting you better at what you're trying to do in that specific movement, and also increases activity of all physiological functions um, specific to those movements. So it's not just getting stronger in that movement, uh, it's having increased work capacity, having the energy systems involved, um, actually operating more efficiently and effectively, and enhancing the necessary energy systems, increasing your capacity to do work in that uh, in that stance. So if you're, I'll, I'll use the running example again, just because it's a simple one that goes across many different sports. If you're able to produce a lot of speed very quickly, uh, but you can't do that repetitively through a 90-minute uh, soccer game or a 60-minute basketball game, how are you going to going to be successful? You need to have that capacity to do so, uh, not just the power and speed. So there's a lot of a lot of factors that you need to take into consideration. Three main features, just to hit on these a little bit. Um, special specialized strength training that we'll, we'll talk about. Improve the ability of the nervous system to generate powerful signals through the working muscles. So I mean that's pretty general as far as dependent on what what your goals are. So if you're trying to increase strength, trying to improve improve the neural firing of those muscles, generate more. Uh, or recruit more motor units. Um, if you're trying to increase power, that's having a faster impulse, things of that nature. Um, ensure the development of uh, specific functional properties. That's kind of what I was talking about with um, the energy systems as far as oxidative and things of that nature go. But also contractile properties of the muscle. If you're trying to train a fast athlete, you need to train fast. You can't just train slow uh, and expect that to translate out onto the field. If you're trying to train an elastic athlete or reactive, being able to hit repeat jumps or quick change of direction, you have to train that. Um, you can't just go through a change of direction and you're jogging and they hit and they pause and then they're coming back out of it. That's not going to be effective to what you want to do. And uh, they also promote an increase in power and capacity of uh, energy transformation. So basically, whatever, the, whatever you're trying to develop, uh, you're increasing the ability for them to do that at a higher power output and uh, for a longer period of time uh, with more readily available energy. So just briefly some examples. There's pretty much all the kinds of strength and things that you can develop in training uh, can be targeted with specialized strength training. It's very broad, but depending on the movement that you're trying to develop and the quality that you're trying to develop at that situation with that athlete, uh, these are just a few examples. So max strength, um, like Augie was talking about with linemen, this might be more of an emphasis where you have a large external resistance in your competitive exercise that you have to overcome. Um, high speed strength movements is when you need to move pretty quickly with not much, if any, resistance. Explosive strength is when there's a need to develop that power, very quick, a uh, large amount of force over a quick, uh, very short amount of time. Uh, starting strength, similar to that, but just having that at the beginning of the movement, you need to be able to develop that force. Uh, jumping off that line, uh, jumping up for a, a tip off in basketball, being very quick at the very beginning. Reactive ability, like I was saying, uh, being able to use the stretch shortening cycle to quickly rebound into second jumps or changes in direction, things of that nature. And then strength endurance and different kinds of, uh, of endurance as well, just the ability to display repeated efforts uh, whether it's strength or power, or just going for a long period of time. And, okay, getting into kind of the nitty gritty of what, what makes a specialized exercise special um, is the principle of dynamic correspondence, or kind of how it correlates to that exercise. Uh, this was termed by, uh, the term was coined by Stephen Hershansky, uh, and they talk about it a lot in their book, Super Training, if you've ever read it. Um, if you haven't, I would suggest trying to work your way through it. It's very tough. Um, I don't know if I've read the entire thing. I bang my head against it probably more than I've made it through. But um, 
dynamic correspondence is essentially an expanded per, uh, version of the set principle. Uh, specific adaptation to impose demands. So basically what that means is your body changes depending on the stimulus that, it, that it's experiencing. You're not going to get stronger if you're using 50% of your mass. Uh, you have to overload. You're not going to get faster if you're just going out and uh, jogging on a treadmill or jogging around uh, for not very long. You're not going to get better at changing direction if you're just working in the weight room and not doing any field work. So uh, dynamic correspondence takes it a little bit further and sets up five, five criteria that means and methods should adhere to, or at least try to adhere to as many as possible. Um, and this is what makes an exercise more specific to uh, the motion or the action that you're trying to develop. So first one, amplitude and direction of movement. Pretty much just what it sounds like. The, to adhere to this criteria, you need to be in the same range of motion and in the same direction as, uh, of that movement. So patterns of movement are relative to the adjacent body part. If you're running, say in an acceleration stance, your torso is at an angle. So if you're working acceleration and you're standing straight up, that's not going to be, uh, be specific to that movement. Uh, same thing if you're doing, to make it highly specialized, if you're doing Olympic lifts to work on high speed running, when you're getting here, and that full triple extension. Yes, there's triple extension in running, but this is a completely different angle relative to what you're doing. So not, I'm not knocking Olympic lifting at all. I'm a big proponent of it, but it might not be specialized specifically to that running speed. And it'll make sense as I go further along. But And it's also specific to the direction of movement and the full range of motion. The two pictures we have here, obviously a parachute run, um, pretty specific, the movement's going to be exactly the same, just the out offering some resistance. And then a hip flexor machine here, that we actually have one down there and it's broken and nobody uses, uses it, thankfully. But um, the range of motion that she's going through in that, and standing here and driving that knee up just from about uh, standing position to here. And not only is that not the full range of motion that you go through in running, so you see the, the parachute here is foot is way back and that's the range of motion he's coming through so with this hip flexor and he's extending coming this way or flexing rather uh, that hip flexor coming through while she is just coming from the standing position straight up and uh, hip flexor is actually more involved when the leg is behind the body than when it, before it swings through so um, <coughs> one of the other criterion actually which I'll talk about here in a second but that's, that's kind of the amplitude and direction. Second uh, criterion would be the region of force production. So muscular force needs to be produced at a specific angle to be related to that exercise. Um, for any movement, the force profile that your body's producing is changing as far as mechanical advantage goes, leverage, all that kind of stuff. Some of the things that Augie talks about, it's not like your isokinetic, your, muscle, your body's not isokinetically working at the same time. So you're not, if I'm producing 100 pounds of force to do this, it's not like my quads are producing 100 pounds of force at all times. Those joint angles change and the requirements of those muscles change as you go. Um, so you must produce required for, force at a specific joint angle that relates to that sport or it relates to that movement. If you're doing something completely different, you change those joint angles, that force profile, that region of force production is going to change. Alright, dynamics of effort. This one's pretty simple. Uh, basically, the overload principle, in essence. Uh, the intensity of training needs to be at least at the level of the competitive movement, if not more so. Uh, there has to be overload of some kind to produce, uh, produce a stimulus to have your body adapt. And it, depends on the type of strength that you're doing. You might not you might not necessarily mean increasing weight, it might be increasing speed. It might be actually decreasing weight and increasing speed if you're uh, trying to develop power or speed strength um, or starting strength. It just depends on what your goal is, on how you manipulate that. That's kind of where your job as a coach or a trainer comes into play. But you have to be challenging that athlete so that they, they get better. Uh, and rate and time, this is kind of related to both of those last two. Uh, rate and time of the force needs to be similar to the, uh, to the competitive exercise. Uh, very important for explosive strength since that's so dependent on time. 
But think about if you're doing a clean or a j jump even. Uh, if you move so slowly until you get that bar almost into the hip pocket and then try to produce all that force, you're not going to have a very successful lift as opposed to uh, building that speed up quickly here and then exploding. I'm talking if they go here and now I try to lift, you're not going to be able to lift much weight. But if that, if that profile, if the rate and time is matching, that will be more effective. Um, also with jump, if you're having people train doing jumping exercises where they're squatting nice and slow and then they go here, notice that they got about six inches off the ground. That's, that's not specific to this criteria and that's not going to be very specific to the, to the overall motion if I was trying to in, increase my vertical jump. And last, last criteria here is just the regime of muscular work. So it describes the type of the types of movements uh, involved in the, or types of muscle actions involved in that movement. And it's tough with uh, team sports, especially where there's a bunch of different things going on. Um, football, you have a bunch of different positions. A bunch of different positions. They're all doing different things at the same time. You have your linemen in an isometric. You have your, I mean, everybody starts slightly in an isometric and they're exploding out. They need starting strength. They need concentric. They need isometric. Static dynamic. Isokinetic at times. Uh, ability to use the uh, shock or the stretch shortening cycle with reactive ability. So there's a lot of different regimes that you could be working in. And it might be that a sport has most, if not all of them. At, and at different times, you have to decide when you can use them. But um, if, say, you're trying to increase uh, somebody's ability to hold the position and you're doing all concentric training, that's not going to be effective. You have to be within that regime to be uh, be corresponding to that exercise. So how do you achieve dynamic correspondence? It's very hard to be matching up five for five on these um, because, as you know, the weight room is not the field. It's hard to mimic every single action that you're doing. And that's where it, it gets tough. But meeting three out of five of those criteria is a good kind of earmark to, to shoot for to have better transfer, um, better training transfer. So I think, uh, my, in my opinion, uh, having a good understanding of biomechanics and just kind of motor learning and seeing what those athletes are doing out in the field can help you assess uh, the sports and the movements that they're doing so that you can find exercises in, in the weight room and while you're doing speed and agility work and anything uh, to, help, to help correlate with that sport movement. And uh, so just take the time to watch practices before. That's what I try to do. Luckily, I work with soccer here. Uh, women's soccer, and I've played four years of college soccer, so I know that pretty well. I don't need to go out to a soccer practice to know what we're doing. But when I worked with softball last year, I tried to go out and watch as much as possible because I, I played baseball through seventh grade or something like that, so I didn't have that memory really of specifically what it felt like to be in those move, movements and see exactly what their bodies are doing. So you have to kind of take a look and see what you can train and get some ideas for movements that you can use rather than just doing basic back squats and hoping that it increases the pitching speed all the time. You've got to bridge that gap uh, and that's where specialized strength training comes into play. Um, so here's some four examples of specialized strength. So take vertical jumps for example. Squats, excessively weighted jumps, leg press. And don't, don't assume that I'm saying these are bad exercises, but they're just not specialized strength training <coughs> exercises. Um, and I'll talk about continuums later where you'll see I might start, if I'm doing a vertical jump, I might start with squats, that's my foundation, and then I build into doing some other things. Sprint speed, that hip flexor machine that I showed you at the beginning, using very heavy sleds like the picture here. If you notice, he's already not running, he's both, both his feet are on the ground, he's in a pretty low posture, uh, that he's, if it wasn't for that weight, he'd be falling over. And, uh, it's a very typical thing you see it in the gym, guys, overweighting, overweighting things and just trying to go after it. It's like, okay, I'm going to jump because you put so much weight on and it's not even going to be effective because those force profiles, those joint angles, uh, all those criteria that I was talking about as far as dynamic correspondence goes uh, are going to be altered and it's not going to transfer as well what you're trying to do. Um, talked about Olympic lifts a little bit as far as sprinting speed. Uh, it's still great for developing power, but not 
totally specific to running. Um, lunges, not exactly specific. And throwing, uh, throwing and even swinging the bat in baseball or swinging a golf club. A lot of people use medicine ball throws a lot of times, which I'm, I like medicine balls uh, a lot. But and I have this problem with golfers because I work with golf here as well. If they're doing a medicine ball throw, they're keeping their hips and shoulders in line and you're not actually using that differentiation between your hips and your shoulders, which is where that power is developed. You need to be able to get the hips through first and then follow through. And it happens in a split of a, split of a second, but it's very key uh, to being able to actively uh, or to effectively have that movement. So if med ball throws are done incorrectly, I would say they are not a uh, specialized strength training exercise. You might still be using that core, but not effectively to translate to the to the uh, to the movement. And if anything doesn't make sense at any time as I go on, no, I have a lot of info to cover, and I want to also get downstairs and show you a few exercises. So just stop me, ask questions, and uh, some good examples. So a vertical jump, depth jumps, uh, weighted jumps, reasonably weighted jumps. Ankle jumps, which would be more just uh, focusing on that plantar flexion with the or, yeah, plantar flexion of the ankle. Repeat jumps if you're doing more reactive ability. Uh, sprint speed, the paw back, the ankle jumps. Uh, bench or cable hip flexor, where you're actually able to work that lower or further back range of motion. And resistant running, with golf, baseball, or any kind of rotational sports. Med ball throws are done correctly. Explosive tricep extensions, even ulnar deviation, something I've gotten into doing with uh, golf uh, right now. And this is getting into like the real ultra specific parts of the parts of the golf swing when they're actually coming through and extending those wrists down to meet the ball. And if they can get that snap if they're doing it correctly within their swing, I don't want to alter their mechanics, but just working on that strength and power on their ulnar deviation, basically extending that wrist. Um, hoping to develop just a little more power if I can add a, a yard to their drive, that's a success in my eyes. Um, also hip rotation, I'll show you one downstairs that actually works on uh, developing that hip rotation and um, almost letting the person learn how to turn those hips rather than keep them locked in because that's often often a problem, especially with our golfers here. They come back, say they met with their swing coach and they don't get their hips through, or their hips and torso are just staying the same, and they're losing yards because of that. And uh, deceleration cutting ability, you can use overspeed, you can use resistive running. Uh, certain plyometric drills that we do a lot here to develop the ability to absorb force and then put it into the, into the next, uh, next movement. Uh, so those would be jump exercises. So those are just some examples, and really there's an infinite number of things, and it depends on the sport or movement you're trying to develop, but those are just a few. All right, so we kind of know what specialized strength is, at least a little bit, and now uh, where does it fit in? So do I just throw this in wherever? Is there a specific part of the year that I want to use it? Um, and the answer for me kind of is both, but your emphasis is different throughout the year. So you have generalized physical preparation, and you have special physical preparation. And if you look at an annual plan like this where everything's nice and blocked out, and this is how I kind of design my annual plans, but it doesn't actually happen like that in training. Things are much more melded together, much more fluid. Uh, so it's not like I would just do general prep and then I absolutely stop that and go into specialized prep. It's more of a shift in the emphasis is, like, is how I like to think about it. So. At the beginning with my generalized generalized programming, that's where my emphasis is, and I'll go into what these specifically are uh, in a minute. But and then as I get more towards the season, that's where specific preparation takes in, uh, takes more of the forefront in the training. And specialized preparatory exercises, specialized developmental exercises, and competitive training exercises are all part of the specific prep and. Specialized developmental and competitive training are actually what I'm going to consider specialized strength training. Um, and here I'll go into kind of definitions of those. So generalized prep uh, doesn't repeat the competitive action. It uses the same muscle groups, but it also uses other muscle groups that might not be involved in the, in the ultimate sport-specific training exercise that you're choosing. 
And uh, just because it's not specific doesn't mean it's not important because it's a foundational exercise. Take squats. Squats, I think, is the best example of GPP for many sports, many movements, um, developing lower body strength and balance and things of that nature. The importance of these generalized exercises is to develop that foundation and uh, it's just not specific to what you're trying to do yet. Specialized prep exercises are still on the general side of things. They don't replicate the competitive actions or its parts, but they are getting a little closer in the fact that they're working the same, the same functions and systems and the same regimes or close to the same regimes that the competitive exercises use. So uh, you're getting a little bit closer. It's not squat. Say if you're trying to develop running speed, maybe you're doing a Romanian deadlift now that's focusing on that hamstring action, which is not entirely specific to your, your running form yet, but it's closer than, than squats were. And all right, now specialized developmental exercises. This is where you're getting very close, uh, very specific to that, to that action. Single joint actions that replicate part of the exercise, part of the or part of the competitive action, and they use the same muscle group, same organs, same energy systems. You're trying to recreate as much as possible um, to that competitive action or the part of that action. And this, which I'll show you downstairs in full effect, is the, the paw back exercise. So I'm thinking in a running form. If I've just driven my leg through and I'm pulling it back, that's that hamstring pulling back, developing force to move forward and to keep you moving forward. So that's very specific to just that part of the motion on, as you'll see in a running form, uh, but that's, that's the fallback exercise. Then we have competitive training exercises. It's a little easier to visualize, I think. It's just easier or more difficult, uh, difficult versions of the competitive exercise. So weighted, weighted jumps, like here on the Vertimax, weighted runs, um, it can be it can be anything, weighted throws, medicine ball throws, things of that nature uh, would be more on this competitive training exercise because it's not working on just the specific part, uh, but it's still a specialized strength training exercise. All right, so these four four kind of classifications, these four categories should exist on a continuum. You can't just go, all right, this block I'm squatting and I'm going to go crazy, get them as strong as possible. Next block, I'm going complete weighted jumps and expect that to be uh, increasing your sprint speed or something like that. Or using the running, uh, going from squats straight into that paw back, straight into resisted running. And I'm not saying you can't use those at the same time. I would even use resisted running during my general uh, preparation phase. But as far as the emphasis of training goes, so what you're spending most of your time on, what you're really looking to improve at that time, uh, you kind of have to go through and make sure you're developing, uh, developing a way. Much like we were talking about with core here, you can't just jump into an advanced exercise, expect to get the full benefit out of it if you haven't laid that foundation. Um, order depends, like the order and how you're developing uh, depends on the sport and the targeted skill. Uh, what's general in one sport might be specific in another sport and completely different in another sport and might not be related at all in that following sport. So a basic process is lay that foundation with general prep, prepare the body for more specialized work with a specialized uh, prep, develop specific, uh, st specific qualities that increasing the working effect of those key movements like I was talking about at the beginning um, with the part method, with the specialized developmental, and then replicating the desired skill and movement with the competitive training exercise. And kind of the way I see it is the last two, uh, specialized developmental and specialized and competitive training exercise can kind of be used at the same time. Uh, so maybe you're, you're working on uh, the vertical jump, you're doing some weighted jumps, but also maybe just focusing on that ankle extension as well. And uh, they'll have similar effects in increasing increasing the working effect of whatever you're trying to do. So here's an example, uh, taking away, uh, just kind of bringing it back into what we're trying to do. Uh, GPP, GPP exercise, say running is what we're trying to improve, sprinting speed more specifically. 
GPP, your emphasis is squatting, getting that lower body strength, setting that foundation. Then with spread, specialized preparatory, you might do the Romanian deadlift, still working that hip extension, um, still working that the glutes and the hamstrings, similar to what they'd be doing in the competitive movement, but it's not at the same speeds. Uh, you're doing both legs. It's not not specific to the movement yet, but it's still developing more closely than, say, a squat. And then you have specialized developmental with that fallback exercise that I showed you the picture of, and then you have resistance sprints. So this is that continuum within this motion, and you can apply this to any movement you're doing, whether it's a lower body exercise, upper body, if you're trying to work on rotation, uh, maybe you first you start with core stability, and then you work your way into doing more rotational power exercises, things of that nature. Um, Considerations, all right, so now I'm uh, going to go through a bunch of things that you can think about that I think are important um, when getting those ideas. Because if you notice, it's a lot of information and there's a lot of, uh, lot of options for you to do, uh, especially with the amount of sports and the amount of movements. Basically, the possibilities are endless. Um, but one thing I think is important to keep in mind is that GPP is just as important as SPP. So, Developing and maintaining general qualities is the main uh, main benefit of GPP. You need to develop that strength, work capacity, and power, etc. So you shouldn't just develop your your squat, develop your lower body strength, and then forget about it completely when uh, the preparatory and in season comes along. But it needs to be maintained. It's just not your main emphasis. And GPP can also be used for correcting imbalances. And preventing injury and things of that nature. So the core exercises, again, that we used here, they're not very specific to any sport. Almost no sport is laying down on the ground. But it's a very good way of training that core and keeping it keeping it stable and keeping the athlete knowing how they can keep that core stable. Uh, so we might use those throughout the year. They might be used in the middle of the competitive season. And it's just not the main emphasis of training. It's not what you're using to try to increase their performance, but it's something that needs to be in place. So don't forget about all the other things as you're trying to do the, the cooler, more sexy, specialized strength training. You have to have that generalized preparation still there. Um, and also with younger, lesser training, especially if you're working with uh, middle school and maybe some half high school athletes, if they don't have the best training background, um, they need to spend more time in GPP. Uh, going back to that foundation, if you if you build a house on a foundation that's sand in your, it's the best house ever, and you have all the bells and whistles in this house, it's your dream house. If it's built on sand, that first storm that comes through, being in Florida here, that first hurricane, the house is gone. You're you're destroyed. So if you don't have that foundation for an athlete, it's exactly the same. Uh, either they're not going to be able to reach their full potential, or they're going to end up getting hurt using some of those specialized exercises because uh, they don't have the base of strength, the base. Uh, stability, balance, endurance, capacity, and uh, so you have to start with the basics. And the good thing, or start with the basics, and the good thing about uh, untrained athletes is pretty much anything you throw at them, they'll get better. They'll get better across the board. You squat them, you don't even spend much time doing vertical jump. You squat them, get them stronger, their vertical jump goes up. They start running faster. They can change direction better. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. It makes you feel like the best coach ever. But really, it's because their bodies are just, all these stimulus, their bodies are just getting better at everything. Um, so you need to develop that, that foundation, and then you'll see those gains. And then kind of on the flip side of that, when the gains kind of start, start uh, stopping, they're not transferring over, you're not seeing that, that's when specialization becomes more important. And it's very important in advanced athletes and more, more trained athletes, so intermediate even as well. Uh, that starts to taper off. So with advanced athletes, for example, squatting more, say a sprinter, like you're saying, well, squatting more is not going to help him. So if his emphasis is to increase that squat, he's probably, I don't know his squat number, but he's probably up there pretty good because fast guys usually can lift a lot of weight. Um, but he doesn't need to try to lift more. He'll maintain that. But increasing that strength is even going to or could possibly slow his sprint speed down because that's not a quality that he needs to display out on the track. Uh, increasing sprint speed won't increase your change of direction ability. It's not specific to what you're trying to do. 
uh, and things of that nature. And I'll show you show you something with trained athletes where exercises correlate and discorrelate or decorrelate uh, based on um, their training classification here in a minute. And something we talk about here uh, amongst our staff all the time are gray areas. And as I was putting this presentation together and thinking about it, I'm like, man, I'm just going to sound like I'm saying this, and then, but it could be this, but it could be this. But everything is a gray area. No exercises are black and white. Uh, front squat's not specialized for pretty much any team sport, if you can think about it, but it is for weightlifting. It's very specific to being able to do clean and jerk standing up out of the bottom if you're picking up. Uh, picking up that that weight, so it's important to work along those continuums uh, in that training cycle and utilize both of those. But remember, like what you're trying to do, what you're trying to train, and uh, don't be afraid to to go kind of outside the box and use different different exercises. You know, uh, some of the some of the pioneers of uh, specialized strength training criticize the U.S. for having a, an obsession with max strength. Probably been guilty with it myself, focusing too much on getting stronger all the time. And then from a sports specific uh, or from a sports performance perspective, if you're not a power lifter or an Olympic lifter, that max strength might not be specialized to what you're trying to do. And I'm not saying don't get your athletes strong. Stronger athletes are usually uh, the faster and more successful ones, but you have to develop those other qualities as well that are going to translate onto the field. And um, just want to reiterate as well, in a GPP phase, uh, specialized strength training exercises can be used, and I think they should be used, uh, whether it's from a learning, motor learning perspective, or getting an athlete used to those motions, just not your main emphasis. Um, that goes vice versa if you're in a sports specific uh, phase, a specialized prep phase, those GPP exercises can be used, whether it's to maintain strength, uh, to work on some new balances, to avoid some injuries. I use a lot of a lot of things, especially within soccer season, I was doing a lot of balance training and things of that nature that have been shown to decrease ACL injuries. It's not really a specific exercise to what they're doing on the field, but it's helping strengthen those ankles, preventing ankle injuries, and also been correlated strongly to uh, prevention of ACL injuries if they're able to stabilize. So kind of a general exercise, or using the core exercises as general exercises, but just as important during the during the end season and the specialized preparatory phase. And don't go overboard. You see it too much. I, I don't remember when it was, but uh, soon after I came here to Weber, um, went out into the weight room, and somebody had a, one of the half Bosu balls sitting on top of of a box, and they're jumping and landing onto a half Bosu ball. And I just turned turned and walked away. I didn't, it's like what is going on? You go and ask them and they say, well, it's sports specific training. Uh, not, not quite. Uh, don't assume that competitive action should just be copied under loads or harder circumstances to uh, make them specialized strength training. Replication does not equal correspondence. You have to remember those five, five criterion of dynamic correspondence. You have to try to meet as many of those as possible. Um, overloaded actions will alter dynamics, positions, firing patterns, and machines can alter those positions as well, and they control your movement in a way that is not natural to what you're going to see on the field on the court. And um, throwing another gray area at you here, uh, just because they're not specialized exercises doesn't mean they're bad. So I just said, don't go overboard, don't do these exercises. But in a generalized generalized phase, you might be wanting to do some sled pushes. Now, at first glance, it looks like it could be specific to running. But if you take a closer look. Her torso angle is very low. She's almost parallel with the ground. Her leg, legs and relative to running speed might be okay, but um, it's not really a specialized strength training exercise because of a few different things. But I used this just a few weeks ago as generalized prep for be on some work capacity with women's soccer. So um, don't think that me talking about all these specialized exercises means that some of the other ones are bad exercises. I still use them. Uh, daily basis pretty much throughout the year. It's just the timing and the, the emphasis that you have. Alright, so the bottom line, uh, shout out to Coach Crawley for training transfer. It's it's all about training transfer. What are we doing in the weight room if 
if it's not helping us out with their athletic performance. It's kind of wasting time unless they're trying to do bodybuilding. That's all they're here for. Uh, really, there's no reason for them to be in here if it's not helping them out. Um, so is what you're doing in the weight room having a positive uh, impact on what they're doing? So transfer can be measured with the gain in sports performance over the gain in, gain in the trained exercise. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to actually get a quantified number for that, that being said, it's very difficult in many team sports to really make that calculation uh, where there's not specific outcomes. Um, say with a soccer player, they score more goals. Some of those statistics you can get, but you can't say, oh, it's because the hip flexor work that I did, that hip flexion exercise. You can't make those, those calls, um, but perhaps with the track and field, if they're running faster, you know that your exercises are probably making an impact. If a uh, baseball player is throwing higher higher velocities, you probably could say something's happening in your weight room that's translating there. Um, same thing with golf. Weightlifting and powerlifting, obviously the connection is very, very close. Um, but it is tough to measure in some of those team sports. So don't get, get carried away and be like, oh, I have to make these calculations and figure it out because it's tough with team sports. And uh, if, if you have some ideas on that, I'd love to hear them as far as as uh, making those calculations. But, and like I was talking about briefly, training classification also uh, affects the transfer of training. And here's a chart from uh, Bonder Truck's work, uh, his book, Transfer of Training. And a bunch of different exercises here on the left, uh, from barbell snatch all the way to throwing, throwing a shot put backwards, 10 pull jumps. And across the top here, this is all for all 100 meter runners. Across the top, uh, starting on the left, you have 10.2 second to 10.5 second runners, so highly qualified. Um, and then, and remember this, he wrote this a while back, so we don't have our Houston bolt down in the nines or anything like that. But that's kind of the high level, very advanced athletes, Olympic athletes. And on your far right, you have a little bit slower, 11.4 to 11.7 second athletes. And, um, these are all just correlations. So if you notice with barbell snatch, the 11.4 to 11.2 second, uh, second runners uh, have an actually decent correlation between those exercises, 0.356, and uh, might not be uh, significantly effect, uh, significant, but there's obviously a positive influence from doing that exercise to their speed out on the track. Now you work your way down, you notice those, those decrease in general, you get to the highly qualified athletes, and it's actually a negative correlation between the two. So as they as they get more advanced, their the the window for what you can do to cause change gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's where those specialized training exercises come into play. Um, so jumps from leg to leg, basically bounding, uh, a plyometric version of running is more specific for those highly trained athletes. So that's where those kind of things come. Come into play. That's where you, as a coach or a trainer, need to look at those exercises and assess your athlete and see what level they're at to see what you need to do to transfer it into the field. Um, and just to end with a quote before, I want to go downstairs and show you a few of those exercises. I know I'm a visual person, so you can see them. Um, but sports, the art of movement, and our job is uh, is to improve movement. So think of think of you in the weight room, especially with these specialized train, strength exercises, improving them and making them faster, making them uh, making them stronger and more powerful within those movements. That's where you're going to have that success as a coach. And that's from Dr. Natalia Rukashansky, uh, Yuri's daughter, who's still talking and speaking today. So if you can get with any of her stuff, uh, watch presentations or anything, it's pretty good. And here's some sources. Uh, I have some cards in the back if you want to get this um, get this presentation. Grab my card or write down my email, and I'll send it off to you. And love to have questions or further discussions at any time. Uh, but definitely thanks to the strength staff here, and uh, that's our great picture at the NSCA conference.